about guilt, but... Are you into, can I ask you a question about guilt? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Just keep going. <laughs> understand for the course of miracles that there's unconscious guilt. So there's this other guilt that you kind of are aware of. You're just like, okay, somebody did something to me. I forgive them. I'm a course of miracles student. I really want to forgive them. But it feels kind of, feels okay. Um, and I'm wondering about unconscious guilt and how you know you've cleared it up. I mean, what is the evidence that you have really forgiven a person, a situation, yourself, or the world. Um, how do you know when it's done? When, you, when you're like, you know what? I've really forgiven them. I don't think about it. I'm not. I'm not I don't feel hurt anymore. Um, but I'm suspecting that that's not enough. I'm suspecting that there's another layer unconsciously, and I'm kind of curious about that. Do you understand my question? Yeah, yeah. I'll give you the, the most direct, simple way. The litmus test is that <clears throat> as long as you believe that there's good guilt and bad guilt, then you can't see that guilt is guilt and let it go. So what do I mean by good guilt and bad guilt? Uh, well, we're pretty familiar with that as we grow up, you know, you should be ashamed of yourself. You should feel guilty. That's terrible. <coughs> oh, that's awful. Uh, and there will be some that will say, you know, uh, the reason we study the past, the reason we study history is so we don't repeat the same mistake. As if, like, studying the problem is ever going to bring a solution. Mm. As long as the mind believes there's good guilt and bad guilt, you know, when somebody watches a trial on TV, like O.J. Simpson trial or something, and then they have a reaction to the, the outcome. I mean, they did polls in America, and after that trial, and even though O.J. was acquitted, the, the polls were going, people were going, Millions and millions of people were going, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> They were saying, I think he did it. They watched the whole trial. Mm, mm, mm. But the idea that, that there's good guilt and bad guilt just maintains the illusion of the guilt. And so what Jesus does in A Course in Miracles is he says that you have to begin to understand, expose your strange attraction to guilt. You know, because it wouldn't stay in your awareness unless you were attracted to it. And the attraction of guilt does involve the attraction of pleasure, both physical and psychological. In this world, pleasure is a good thing, pain is a bad thing. Pleasure is to be maximized, pain is to be minimized. And no one who walks this world asleep and dreaming understands that they're both the same. You can't have one without the other. It's, they're both the same. And so as long as you play the game of trying to attract one and repel the other, then the unconscious guilt you're talking about stays packed down very deep and you're totally unaware of it. In fact, Jesus even has a line in the Course where he says, it's impossible to seek for pleasure without finding pain. And he goes on to say that the ego does not want this idea raised into awareness, because the more you get aware of this trick that's going on in the unconscious mind, then you start to see, hmm, I would rather have joy, I would rather have peace, I would rather be free, have freedom in my mind than to be attracted and, and stuck in a prison that I don't understand what's holding me in jail. So there's quite a lot in the course about, about guilt 
but just on the surface, I would say, just go in your life and start to ask yourself, where in my mind, if I search my mind, where do I still believe in, in good guilt? Where do I still believe that, that there's, guilt is justified? And that's a good start, because that's, that's a way of still holding on to it. Hmm. And, and you can just listen, and when it starts to come out of your mouth, like, ever, you ought to be ashamed of yourself, or, you know, those kind of thoughts, those are coming from that belief that's down there. Okay, uh, just for clarity, I heard you say, that I get, you know, the, the, uh, and I'm there, I'm there, I'm like, everyone's done the best job that they could, no matter what, under the circumstances, they acted in the best way that they could, they used the resources they had, they grew up in a certain way, so that I've done. That everybody's guilt free. So that part I get. Now the other part about the pain and pleasure part, are you saying that if you still find yourself preferring pleasure over pain, that that's an indicator that there's still work to be done? You are. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you are and you and you did say that that is attached to you're also saying that that's attached to perhaps this unconscious guilt. I'm having trouble figuring that. I, I understand what you're saying. I'm having trouble matching those two things up. I'm not necessarily, this might not be the time to explain it. I can research it in the book. But, um, Let's take some practical examples. Maybe that'll help make it clear. Like a lot of times guilt is associated with the body. People have a lot of guilt associated with body image, size, shape, type, complexion, and on and on. They have, they have a lot of guilt associated with sexuality. They have a lot of guilt associated with body parts. Certain parts are humiliating. Certain parts are not to be exposed. Certain parts are dirty. Um, other parts are, are to be lifted up and and seen as important or attractive and so on and so forth. It's the same thing with carrying on with body fluids. Some fluids are good. The mind thinks those are good fluids. I'm glad I have those fluids. Other times those are not good fluids. If the red fluid comes out <laughs> of the body, for most people there's an association something's wrong. The red fluid is not supposed to be coming out. The yellow fluid can, but the red fluid, no. And then there's appropriate times for fluids to come out. <laughs> of the nose, of the mouth, of other orifices, and so on and so forth. And there's a lot of guilt associated with these fluids. They're just fluids, mind you. They really don't have any meaning to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit sees the body as neutral, Fluids are fluids, and the timing of fluids. Certain fluids are not supposed to come out at certain times, and out of certain orifices. It's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. So, what I'm using these body examples is because it's not. It doesn't take very long to start to see that there's some guilt and humiliation associated with these bodies, body parts, and fluids. I did a whole talk when I was in China with a friend of mine who had immense immense guilt over sexuality and he spoke for quite some time, maybe 45 minutes or so, just pouring out all of his hidden thoughts and going, giving us a graphic blow-by-blow -blow description from his childhood on up with every descriptive detail imaginable and his face just contorting with guilt as he was even speaking about these things. And then he opened up, and then I, and the Holy Spirit came through with what I was just talking about in the most light, comical way, completely washing away the guilt around all of his sexual interpretations, what he did wrong, where he was humiliated, where he felt shame, and that's the title of the DVD, Healing the Shame of mm -hmm. Sexuality, something along those lines. So I, that's, I'm using this example with the bodies because it's, it's something I think most people can relate to. Um, 
he had shame even about showering with other other boys when he was younger or other men. He would not shower in public places because of the guilt and humiliation. It was all, he hadn't had a, a relationship even. Um, what we would call, what would seem to be like even a normal relationship in this world. His whole life was tainted by this very thick guilt. And mm -hmm. we just joined together and you should have seen the smile beaming on his face at the end of the conversation. Um, it was like, oh, I'm free. And then of course, uh, shortly after that he ended up with his first girlfriend. Um, he didn't waste any time. <laughs> But even that was just more mirroring, not that getting a girlfriend was going to be the thing that would save, save his life, but it was, it was, he was freed up to start to let the Holy Spirit take it even further and wash even more guilt out of there. So, so I think it's good that you're asking this because, you know, that's what I mean by attraction, repulsion, pain and pleasure. It's this positive and negative thing where we're taught to believe certain things are very, very positive and certain things are negative, but there's no cultural agreement. If you go around the world, the cultures don't agree on those positives and negatives, which means they're all just, they're all judgments. And they keep the mind in guilt. And our mind will vouch for me with this. <laughs> A test. <laughs> that makes sense because if you have a preference for something like your body's a certain way and you you it not the way you want it, you I can see that you would think, oh well. It's not the way I want it. I must have done something wrong, or I could have had it the way that I wanted it. Something like that. I think I can get to that that way. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, why wouldn't it be this way? I must have done something wrong, because I wouldn't have it this way. So, that's give me good food for thought. That's a good... Trail to walk down. Yeah. That's some great hypothetical thinking that I'm going to pursue after <laughs> <laughs> okay. Acceptance is wonderful. If you, if it's like let all things be exactly as they are. If you just come to a place of acceptance, you see that acceptance is non-judgment. And, and how wonderful that feels. You don't have a push and this drive in your mind to try to change, make, improve. Self-improvement. If God created us perfect, why should we so be, be so preoccupied with self-improvement? We were created perfect at the get-go. We don't need to improve upon the perfection. That's all we have to do is accept our perfection. And some people say, well, that's easier said than done, but no, actually, it's, it's mm -hmm. easier to accept your perfection than it is to deny your perfection. In, from a place of unworthiness. I'm not worthy of, of love, I'm not worthy of respect and all those things. You know, that's much more difficult, I found. Mm. I, I've seen the flip is much easier. So you can be playful and happy and joyful, just enjoy and laugh and, and not put an emphasis on anything and really not try to seek to improve. You could retire from self-improvement. You could take early retirement from self-improvement. That works. our daily routine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was brought up in the Lutheran Church. 
I don't know if you remember the words of the Nicene Creed. I am a poor, miserable sinner, starts out. And <laughs> from so it, it's just a totally different mindset, and it's wonderful to, to be able to look at that and say, I don't want that anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great that you can see that. You remember that from the past, but then you think, no, I don't, I don't want that. It's, innocence is wonderful, but again, it's, it's just, it's like good guilt, bad guilt. It's, it's the belief that innocence has an opposite. That what, is what denies innocence. If you believe that innocence has an opposite, mm -hmm. then that just means you've never known innocence. Because innocence is not the opposite of guilt. That's the ego's version of innocence, the opposite of guilt. Like the, the guilty ones go to prison and the innocent ones go free. Hmm, that's not going to get us back to heaven. Hmm. It's still very dualistic. But an innocence with the I am presence, before Abraham was I am, an innocence that knows no opposite, is prior to all dualistic concepts. And that's what you're opening to. You're opening to that which is prior to time. You'll never find the present moment in the middle of the past and the future, too. I'll tell you, if you look for it there, you won't find it. But, but it's actually prior to this world. So it's like tabula rasa, it's a clean slate. It's pure, it's, there's nothing tainting it. We're looking at some hypotheticals today where the, uh, the character of David appearing in a courthouse scene and I said, oh, I'm not really attracted to that because it, it doesn't make any sense to me. In, in a courtroom scene, there's, it's, it's set up to prove guilt or innocence and I don't believe that it can be found in that context. It has to be found inside your heart. The world will try to prove who's guilty and who's innocent, but, but inside your heart you can find the state of mind that's so far beyond that whole game that, that you will never even attempt to find it. You don't have to prove your innocence. I love how like, even in this country it says you're innocent until proven guilty. But that second part, the possibility of guilt, is not good news. <laughs> is if your innocence can be taken away, if you're proven guilty. Mm -hmm. But we're actually going for forgiveness, which is a state prior to the possibility of guilt. So innocence is a state of being, it's our inherent nature. Yes, it's our, it's our state of being. It's not a concept. <laughs> One time I was traveling around the country and I was traveling with a married woman and we stopped off to do a Course in Miracles gathering and, and uh, it turns out she was having an affair with our host um, and uh, the next day we got down to get in the car and they gave me, the, they both gave me this look, like this real sheepish look. Like he knows. <laughs> he knows. Like he gave me. They gave me a. He knows look, and I just gave him a look like. <laughs> no, I don't. Don't, don't pin that on me. If I, don't think that I'm going to be the judge of something in this world. I just look back at him like. No. You know, but it, it wouldn't it be great? Put yourself in my shoes if you to be a bringer of this innocence I'm talking about, wouldn't you feel good? No matter what was happening, no matter what look you got, you just give them the look, mm, no, <laughs> I love you, I still love you, and you're still innocent, and 
what you think you've done, you really haven't done. That's what Jesus was doing, you know? Mm -hmm. He would, even when they would bring the woman to him that they caught in the act of adultery, all these men, they think they've got, they've caught her, they, they've caught her in the act of it. He would maybe draw some stuff in the sand, but, you know, I, he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Well, there was one there who was without sin, it was called the Christ. Totally without sin. Ah, he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. All the stones drop. <laughs> Jesus knew that was a good question. <laughs> and then she turns to him and said, Lord, what do you say of me? I condemn you not. Go your way and sin no more, which I would say, go your way and stay in alignment with the, your innocence. That's all he was saying. And I condemn you not. He was not capable of finding guilt. Not capable, because he knew that it doesn't exist. Now that's a light. And that's a way shower. That's, that's just a great example for us. If we can experience that same innocence and give it away freely, to everything and everyone, that's how we keep it. We keep seeing it, hmm. keep extending it, and keep aware of it. So that's, that's how it works. translated or wrote it had that mentality of sin so he probably never said and sin no more he probably said something much more like be innocent you know? be in your innocence but that's the problem with trying to interpret what he really said <laughs> I think sin in the Aramaic was was uh, interpreted to mean missing the mark uh, a very different connotation. He said, like a black mark on your soul, just missing the mark. It means there's the, the bullseye is the innocence, and if you if you miss the mark, you just haven't hit the innocence. You haven't known the innocence. So mm -hmm. it's very different from this idea that that we're sinners. That you know that there's an identification with that. And in the Course in Miracles, Jesus says, he redefines sin, he says, sin is an error to be corrected. Isn't that a very different definition? I never heard that growing up in Christianity, but I did hear it when I read it in the Course. An error to be corrected. Ah, well then, thank you very much. I'm, I'm open to that. And he certainly doesn't tell us to identify with it. Don't identify with the error, identify with the correction. Mm -hmm. There's a book, I don't know if we have it out there, that I compiled. I had students back in the 1990s, and most of my students were raised in the Judeo-Christian culture. And so I made a, a book called The Bible Course Companion where I, I had questions given to me to ask to Jesus, and then I would answer from Scripture in the Bible and A Course in Miracles. Oh. Back, you know, both. Every question had Scripture from the Bible, Scripture from the Course. Hmm. So much clarification. I would, I would read that book and I would get so high, I would be so high. Then I would go out among the people in the United States and it would come through in their language. Because um, most of them are Bible-based. Most of them had not heard or read the Course. It's virtually unknown you know, in comparison to the Bible. So now we've redone it. It's called My Meaning in Scripture. Really just Jesus clarifying, this is what I meant. This is what mm. the Scriptures truly mean. And there's a lot of errors that are corrected. Because of upside-down thinking, sin-based thinking, distorted thinking, 
misinterpreted the Bible. It's a new book when you have the eyes to see. It's a whole new book, but sure. without that, it's it's a tough read. Mm -hmm. It's pretty dark. Yeah.